Yeah, we started on time. Okay, they said it couldn't be done. And by they, I meant most of my production staff. They didn't think we could do it, but we basically did it. JR, welcome to the show. On time, mostly. Glad to have yeah, you Yeah, I mean, we, we've got mostly, we've got kind of, we've got they, unidentified people. I mean, I don't know, this is... The shady starts at the time. <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit. But um, welcome everyone to the show. Uh, it is Tuesday, but it was Emma's week, and so it's JR Tuesday for you. Uh, no, we love Emma. Her schedule is uh, turbulent, to say the least. But so we're Emma, glad to have you here. Emma's every other week, eh? Yeah, exactly. So basically, uh, one week we'll have Emma, and then the next week we have Jordan Yule, and they sort of go back and forth <laughs> on Tuesdays. Uh-huh. Oh, um, excellent. Yeah, it's been going on for a long time. I don't know if people know that. <laughs> but anyway, that's the way it's been working for a long time. But very glad to have you here, and uh, especially because we have a lot that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be starting off in just a bit, talking about uh, Mitch McConnell. Always fun. Uh, implications of COVID-19 for children. The theory has been they're good with this stuff, but it turns out there might be a linked uh, illness that's uh, causing some problems. So we're going to talk about that. We've got Chris Christie weighing in on what should be done. And, um, you know, people have probably noticed, especially early on, when people needed to start wearing masks, they would wear just whatever they had around. Well, one yeah. guy in San Diego, he had something very regrettable that he decided to wear as a mask. So we're going to be talking about that. And uh, Lincoln Project has come, uh, like Never Trump or Republican group, they've come out with a new ad attacking Donald Trump. And um, when they release these, I think that what they're going for is they want Trump to see it and get mad. But how would you know for sure? Well, in this case, now they know for sure. <laughs> so we're <laughs> going to be showing that. That's going to be a little bit of fun to sort of close out uh, to close out the show. Uh, but to everybody who's already here and piling into the chat, thank you so much for doing that. We're going to be reading some of your comments and uh, super chats and tweets. And also, if you're commenting on Twitch, because, of course, we're also broadcasting on Twitch, we're going to be reading some of that um, as well a little bit later on. Early heads up, too, that uh, today, following the main show, we're going to have our uh, Giving Tuesday special, where uh, Jank is going to do an hour where he lays down his, I think he's calling it his five-year plan for progressives to take over. And Uh then... (laughs) So I'm I'm excited to find out what it is. And um, Anna Kasparian and myself are then going to be joining. We're going to be playing some games, responding to some um, comments and stuff like that. It should be a lot of fun. So you'll have that to look forward to. play later. games like Heads Up and stuff? Taboo? Uh, I don't think so, but that would be fun. Dungeons and um, and Well, I mean, come on. That would be great. <laughs> People have been requesting it. Uh, also, I want to respond to the, one of the first questions from the chat. Uh, these are not pajamas. It's a shirt. It's from the Banana Republic. I don't know why everyone thinks it's pajamas. Do they really? I didn't think that at all. This was one of my Hawaii was... shirts. I got yes. engaged in this shirt. <laughs> and um, my background is subtly different. I'm just trying to mix it up a little bit. But the same basic idea. Uh, anywhere, J- uh, anyway, uh, JR, why don't we jump into it? Wow. Wait, how did the first... Man, minutes just fly by on this show. Okay, all well, right. with that, we're going to start talking. Mitch McConnell has a plan to deal with the crisis in America. Not the pandemic, mind you, but the crisis wherein there are still some judges that were not confirmed by conservatives. And uh, he's got a plan to fix it. Uh, But there is a brief hiccup just days before the Senate Judiciary Committee is set to consider the nomination of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's protege to a federal appeals court. The court's chief judge requested an investigation of McConnell's role in creating the vacancy. So this has to do with Judge uh, Justin Walker of Louisville uh, for the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the District of Columbia. And a number of different uh, activist groups have, uh, they, they sent in basically a petition, a complaint saying that uh, they believe that Mitch McConnell is going around and putting pressure on many judges to retire whilst he still has basically unilateral authority to put whoever he wants um, into these positions. This is uh, a particular application of that to this one individual, but the the idea that he was going around pressuring these judges, that has been a story for months now, and there's a lot of reason to believe uh, that that is going on. So we're going to have more on this particular individual, how unqualified uh, he is uh, to serve in the federal judiciary. Um, but uh, JR, I know you're, you're a big fan of Mitch McConnell, <laughs> an apologist, if you will. Do you think that people are being unfair to him in trying to put up a, an obstacle to confirming this guy? Mitch McConnell has had this entire time, especially with the presence of Donald Trump, has not been 
uh, shy as McCoy has not been covering the fact that he wants to use him for his own purposes. And his number one thing is judges. It went back to the Obama administration when he said, I'll make sure that I block those judges for anything Obama does, because that's what I'm looking to do. His other thing was keep him as a one term president again, back with Obama. Then after that didn't work out, then it's just, let's just make sure nothing works. No judges get pushed through because that is the fabric of society that he wants to shape to fit his own narrative and his own worldview. Uh, for years to come, far after he's gone. That's what he's looking to do. Mitch McConnell can, actually can't stand Donald Trump. We know that all Republicans, especially the establishment ones, couldn't stand Donald Trump. He's there, this is his uh, This is his one agenda point that he's looking to get through. So his kneeling to Donald Trump has nothing to do with having any affinity for his policies or the way he does stuff. It's to get things like this done. So this is absolutely not surprising at all. Exactly, and you would at least hope, perhaps, that if they're going to try just ramming people through it, like find an actual judge, like a judge who's a Republican or a conservative or whatever, like at least provide a little bit of cover, imply to us that you care about the actual functioning of the courts. Yes. You want to slant it heavily in your direction, but you still want people to know what they're doing. Um, that increasingly so has not been the case. So the American bar association standing committee on the federal judiciary last year rated Walker, not qualified for the district court saying that he had never tried a case, either civil or criminal, as lead or co-counsel. But who cares? I mean, he should definitely be in charge of reviewing cases from... Why? Why? You can't find a single person? It's almost, it's almost as if, as in every other area of government, yes, they want to slant it to their interests, but they also want to make sure that it doesn't function. They we want have... to destroy it. No, no, we've, we've severely overestimated the competency and uh, the maturity of, our, of elected officials in this country. So we always had this assumption that they're smarter, that they're better, that they have foresight, that they're looking to do something for more people. I don't know why we thought that, but people thought that. And again, this has been exposed more and more that it's like, it's not even just a good old boys club, it's like a frat. So the thought process for a frat is, hey, I'm just getting my boys here, because who cares, let's drink and party and do whatever. And you bring in guys, who cares if they're qualified, who cares if they can do things the right way, you just bring in your boys. That's all this is now. There's not much of a thought process because they don't have to anymore. They don't have to cover it up and say, we have a responsible person here. Hey, he's going to do something for you. The, the fact that they've got people nodding their heads for death, they're like, well, what can we not do? We've got yeah. them agreeing to death. Great. Yeah. Yeah, and by the way, I believe that this individual is one of the ones that we talked about uh, last year. There were there were a few um, people that they'd put up for these positions that um, either had never studied law or couldn't actually pass the bar. One had written a bunch of sci-fi horror novels. That seemed to be his biggest qualification. And like, you know, I, I respect it. <laughs> like, that's cool. <laughs> but not necessarily yeah. for the courts. Um, so that individual that the Bar Association said was not qualified... Uh, in his present position, was confirmed by the Senate 50 to 41. I don't know exactly how that breaks down. Probably like a bunch of Republicans and Democrats on one side, and then a bunch of Democrats and Republicans on the other side. No, it's probably party line. Um, <laughs> and McConnell praised the pick, saying in a statement that Walker is, quote, an outstanding legal scholar who represents a, quote, new generation of federal judges. So I'm going to take issue with that first quote. Don't think he's an outstanding legal scholar, but I will agree with him that he does represent a new generation of federal judges, at least as far as the Republican Party is concerned, uh, for many of the same reasons that you described. They want flunkies. They want people that are going to do whatever they want. Going to be, they're just going to go in there, hundred percent corrupt, um, and give them whatever whatever they want. And no matter how horrible at his job he is, no matter how inefficient, no matter how biased, he will hold that position, the current one, let alone the new one that he's going up for for decades and decades because they are choosing uniformly the same sort of person unqualified yes um but white and male and very very young that is what they are choosing that's the idea it's to change it from now on you know so what uh, 38 years old is this uh this latest his protege mm -hmm. so it's it's the it's the same i'm not sure how many of the favors or whatever else he's done for him as his protege or however much he's decided to be like, I'll be your clone. But it's it it takes a certain kind of person to feel like you have to push so these legacy people to push the same person you are is created in another one for years to come when you're gone. Hey, when I'm gone, I couldn't care less about who's gonna continue to do exactly what I'm doing. I'm not here. You know, you care about your kids being fine and well off, but you don't want them to necessarily do 
anything just become you. It's, yeah. just, it's, a, it's an odd ego, like maniacally ego, 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 ego maniacal thing that you can do. Yeah. But it's all just, it's, it's, it's at the cost of the rest of the country, just for him. Exactly. And um, he's got his mission and he's pursuing it. He said earlier this year, my motto for the year is leave, leave no vacancy behind. That hasn't changed. The pandemic will not prevent us from achieving that goal. And why would it? If that's the only goal you have, that's your only concern during the pandemic, I mean, sure, you could you could probably get it done. And he's been doing a good job. As of this week, he's confirmed 51 circuit court judges, 139 district court judges, while Trump has been in office. To put it in perspective, that 51 circuit court judges, Barack Obama got 55 in two complete terms, not three-fourths of his first term. And, uh, and that, that's the strategy. And really fast, just to put it in perspective, because I've been thinking about this a little bit, like to give you an idea of how long term the damage has already been done, let alone four more four more years, Jesus. Let's say hypothetically Trump loses somehow. And let's say we have four bad years of Biden. And then let's say uh, Ted Cruz comes in and he serves four years and it's a disaster. And, uh, you know, now AOC ready to run for president. She gets elected. She serves two terms. And then she transitions out and then something happens for like four or eight years. And then we get a new progressive president, some politician you never even seen yet. They're not even there. They will have laws overturned by this guy <laughs> and all Isn't of these crazy? other judges. No, I'm th- like decades later, they That's will pass the- legislation. Ideas we don't even have yet will be overturned by these troglodytes. That is okay, how so, long-term this strategy, and that's baked in, let alone yeah, four more years. Great illustration, because, and also the fact to bring up the Obama administration and what he got passed through for eight years, right? <clears throat> so some of the problems that progressives had with Obama was not being aggressive enough or strong enough, especially when he had control of Congress as well during his first, uh, you know, the first couple of years in office. Um, so you have to take advantage of that. So when people say, hey, let's go ahead and, and come in there and and flip the place upside down and we're like, oh, and you have people like Biden, as much as he thinks this is, this is a, an election strategy, is I'm willing to work with Republicans. No, no, I want Republicans in my cabinet. No, I want Republicans to help me decide these things that are going to change things for the future to come. They don't care about anything you're trying to do. Yeah. They care about getting these things done. So when you come in and you say you want to be this and they're going to call you a barn burner and, and un-American and all this stuff, flip America upside down by doing these progressive things and you could be afraid to do them, see what they've actually done and how long those things they've done will affect America. And we're too afraid to do it right away. Just yeah. look at the comparison to the way these approaches happen. And, and this is why uh, uh, many progressives are upset about a middle of the line establishment, uh, 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 help out Republicans approach that many uh, yeah. Democrats have. Well, and, and by the way, like, like, you don't think that like Biden isn't going to say in the next two months, let's say, you know what? Um, when like, when picking Supreme Court justices, I wouldn't rule out a Republican if they had totally. the right views, like something like that. It's, like, ah, it's from every Why? side. Why? Why? Because later on, they're gonna get congratulated for it. Are they gonna put up a statue mm-hmm. of you because you doing someone else that's gonna destroy America? I... Well, look, it's easy to say that, but the very hostile Republican Party to Obama in the first few years, after he did a bunch of overtures, they were really they were much nicer to him in the last <laughs> four. What a bunch of idiots. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic or UNFTR, The host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. 
And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. From nearly the beginning of the pandemic, at least in the U.S., we've been relatively sure that while COVID-19 can be devastating, especially for older individuals, those with certain underlying conditions, for the most part, the youngest people are do relatively well with it. Um, They die at very low rates. They tend to not suffer the worst sorts of uh, side effects. But that doesn't mean that there aren't issues. Of course, six uh, children have already died of COVID-19 in New York, but now we're finding out that there's the possibility that a sort of mysterious new complication potentially linked to coronavirus is beginning to show up in New York as well as in multiple countries uh, in Europe. This is coming from reporting from the New York Times, and I want to give you some of the initial details. 15 children, many of whom had the coronavirus, have recently been hospitalized in New York City with a mysterious syndrome that doctors do not yet fully understand. Many of the children, ages 2 to 15, have shown symptoms associated with toxic shock or Kawasaki disease, a rare illness in children that involves inflammation of the blood vessels, including coronary arteries. Now, a little bit more of what we know so far. Bolton said that most of the 15 children had a fever and many had a rash, vomiting, or diarrhea. Since being hospitalized, five of them have needed a mechanical ventilator to help them breathe, and most of the 15, quote, required blood pressure support. And so we it, it seems like many of the people, the kids, that are coming down with this had coronavirus or have coronavirus, but it doesn't look like they all do. But it seems to be sprouting up in areas that have a lot of coronavirus for reasons that aren't necessarily uh, fully understood yet, JR. Right. Oh. Okay, so as these studies go, and as you know, everyone is generally uh, keeping staying indoors to avoid this, we're going to see stories like this. And I didn't know the realm of where it would come. You know, we talk about mutations, and we talk about vaccines, and then once that vaccine comes, we're going to need a new one every year. But what we kept missing was potential effect on children, because right from the beginning, we hear something that's new, this novel coronavirus, and then we go, oh, but it doesn't affect children, so move on. And I didn't want to be that worrying person to be like, hey, I hear you right now, being what, February, March, right now it's that way, but let's keep an eye on this. You know, it doesn't mean, because, okay, the times that I've been out and they say keep your distancing and you can exercise or you can do this or whatever, and you see people out, I see a lot of people out with masks on and their children without masks on. And I'm like, I feel like we're pushing this hey, kids don't get affected, so leave the kids, leave it off the kids because they probably don't like it on their face, me, uh, a thought process. And we have to be diligent. I mean, it's being over overprotective, sure, but I think this is when, in one of those situations when we need to be. Because look, even in, this, even in these findings we have now, it's not conclusive. We don't know exactly what's going mm-hmm. on and why it's happening, but if you're the parent of these five or six children in New York that have already been affected to this point by it, that's not a good feeling. You don't go, yeah, you ask these families of these five five or six kids. They don't go, yeah, it doesn't affect kids. Guarantee you they're not telling us that story because mm-hmm. it has affected their kids. Yeah. Yeah, and like this, again, we don't know for sure if this is directly tied with coronavirus. Um, we're we're going to get accused of fear-mongering and driving a panic anyway because apparently I want to give – my 401k a second kick in the nuts for some reason that I don't understand, but that's what they'll say. Um, we don't know for sure. We are talking about this because it is concerning. I thought it would be especially concerning for JR because JR has children. So um, if this is connected, that's not good. The fact that it can apparently result in some of the same sort of serious complications of coronavirus is also worrying, although we have acknowledged um, so far, none of the children, at least in the United States, have died from this, although they have been hospitalized and you know, being put on a ventilator, having blood pressure problems, those sorts of things. That is very worrying. We are trying to be level headed about this. Um, but it also is important to put this out there because there are some people that have landed on kids are like effectively they won't say it. But what they mean is kids are immune. We don't have to worry about anything involving kids. And so they're using kids to push the agenda of here are things that we need to open up. And if you're against opening this up, it's unscientific because kids are fine. Why can't we open up elementary schools and things like that? And we've been pushing back against that for some time. I think, Jerry, you might have been on the show when 
was it when Tucker Carlson was like live fact checked about that? Maybe it was Brett. I'm not sure. <laughs> but he he had a doctor on that he wanted to say kids also don't spread it as readily as adults. And the doctor corrected him in real time. But he had the guy on because he has an agenda that the guy was supposed to fit into, not because Tucker Carlson at the end of the day is primarily worried about the health of kids or the adults around kids. Absolutely not. So this is the thing. So again, and it's part of the push, I think, Ron DeSantis, maybe Florida is one of the states that was looking to open and they said, hey, you know, so by the way, you know, kids, Trump said it. So kids, you know, they apparently appear to be not affected by it. So let's open up schools, you know, because schools, uh, you know, there's that kid principal, there's that kid uh, administration staff, there's that kid on the on the board of education, there's that kid that, that conducts classes, they're called teachers. Wow, you mean there's adults at schools too? It's crazy. So just because they had this, this, uh, I guess we, we had a little bit of a belief that children weren't affected by it, which I don't think ever was fully the case. Opening up schools was the agenda. At least it was one of the agendas. Mm-hmm. There's adults at schools. And guess what kids come home to after school? Adults. Yeah. Some of them live with grandparents. Some of them have grandparents around them. A, sometimes some of the people that work at those schools are also old. I don't, I don't get how we, we can throw that out there and not enough people go that doesn't make any sense children don't run schools <laughs> it's weird that school would suck it would not last long <laughs> kids once ran Recess this all island and it didn't go well there either um <laughs> there was like a pig who was watching them i don't know but anyway no it's yeah and all we do every day is we do the show and we try to grab people joe biden style by the lapels and say be reasonable. And for most people, their response is, no, no, I have an agenda. I'm going to be safe. I'm going to be fine. My kids are homeschooled or my kids go to super elite school where everything's going to be, you know, UV raid every two seconds. Um, It's going to be people in public schools and things like that that are going to be put at risk of this. And I hate that the kids have to stay home. I do. I know it's got to be terrible for adults to have to teach them all of a sudden. And it's bad for the kids, too. Many Like, I um, I have uh, two cousins, uh, my two younger cousins. This They miss their prom, and uh, they're, they don't really have a graduation. And if this lasts long enough, their first semester in college is going to be remote. I loved my first semester of college. I don't want people to be disrupted in this way. And Listen, it's every time someone tells you, or if you're a... Not even on live. If you're a, 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 a common sense thinking person, and said you just want us to stay inside. You want to destroy the economy. You want this. Look, like, okay. So you have all the answers, idiot. You tell me why I live ten minutes from the beach and I, don't, I suddenly never want to go anymore. Hey, you tell me why I don't want to make any money. Hey, you tell me why. Like you want to give me all the answers why I, why this motivation is for me to not have anything. Uh, then you go ahead and explain. It. There's no answer for it. They just want to call you a demon and say you don't like this. Say you want to disrupt America. What makes me want to disrupt America? Where am I going? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm taking off somewhere once I light America on fire. Come on. Yeah. Well, you spend a lot of time on your yacht. Um, But anyway, uh, (laughs) yeah. So what they want you to believe that the argument is, and I understand we're talking about this ahead. We're going to be talking about Chris Christie anyway, is that um, these damn libs, they say they want to protect your health, but really... Uh, They don't care about the people that have lost their jobs or temporarily furloughed or staying at home. And so these libs in under the guise of protecting your health are willing to ruin your economic status. Us conservatives, we're going to pretend that we still care about your life because we're going to tell you it ain't that deadly anyway. But we care about your future and your bank account. That's why we're working to get you back out there. That is not what the dichotomy is. I'm saying... I don't want you to die and, and get this, the part that they don't want you to think about, I want the government to help sustain you until it's safe for you to go back out there. I want there to be recurring stimulus checks. I want there to be robust unemployment. I want there to be uh, universal health care, all of this stuff. They always leave off what is supposed to aid people in getting by. They want to pretend that we don't care about people's um, economic health. We don't We don't care if they go bankrupt and all of that. No, they don't care about that. They don't care if their Absolutely. short-term plan results in far more deaths. It's going to, going to balloon and it's going to destroy more businesses and more lives. Anyway. I honestly, will, I will, they don't I, care unless it's 
their kids. Back to the kids. They won't care unless it's their kids. Keep well, it I hope that their kids don't get this, but I will end by saying pediatricians have urged families whose children have high fever, rashes, or stomach pains to call doctors immediately. Some have said that they are concerned that parents might not take their children to the hospitals because of the pandemic. That is yep. an understandable fear. Um, but if your kid is experiencing those symptoms, understand, you might want to get it looked at. From the beginning of this thing, we've all been wondering, what does Chris Christie think about the pandemic and what should be done? Let's take a look. Of course, everybody wants to save every life they can. But the question is, towards what end ultimately? Are there ways that we can thread the middle here to allow there, that there are going to be deaths? And they're going to be deaths no matter what. And if we can do things to keep people in the mode of wearing masks, of wearing gloves, of, of you know, distancing where appropriate, we've got to let some of these folks get back to work because if we don't, um, we're going to destroy the American way of life in these families and it will be years and years before we can recover. Okay, so JR, um, that's uh, Chris Christie and uh, he's saying we got to get back to work. So that's that's what we generally hear. We should acknowledge he's at least saying in some areas, there should continue to be social distancing. So, like, I think he deserves some credit over and above other commentators on Fox. How much credit or any credit at all do you think he deserves? Well, it's, it's, um, there's specific, there's, there's qualifying words that are thrown in there. He said, some people get back to work. Which people are those? Mm -hmm. People that help you do the things that you'd like to continue to do. Not the people that are like you, not the people that, uh, that are too rich and powerful to, to contract the virus. No, not those people. We need those people. We need the foot soldiers. We need the ground game. We need the people that are expendable yeah. to go back to work so that we can continue the American way of life. I was just tweeting about this. So the American, what is the American way of life? It's this economy that we tout all the time. It's our, our, our foothold on the rest of the world. We're the richest. We're the baddest. We do this the best. We're stronger. It's that. That's the American way of life. So the low-level worker at McDonald's or the person who, who – and not even low-level, the person who delivers your mail because, you know, people like Chris Christie, they're not going to be walking around the neighborhood with shorts on, maybe dealing with dogs and yards and stuff and delivering mail, even something as simple as that. They won't do those things. But the people that like him, they're, none of them are saying, hey, you know what, so I think we need to get back to work. And all my employees that are, are most vulnerable, have the least amount of health care, have the least amount of money, have the least amount of power to actually fight something like this – they stay at home and I'm going to get in there and I'm going to be on the front lines because I really believe in this. They're vehement about how they believe in opening this country back up, continuing the American way of life for themselves. The American way of life is for them. Mm -hmm. He's not going out there and saying, I need my McDonald's worker to continue their way of life, so I'm going to die for them. Mm -hmm. It's the other way around. I need the McDonald's worker to die so I can continue my way of life because I guarantee you, and I'm just using McDonald's as, as an example. But because if he goes through his drive through every weekend and he knows uh, 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 James at the drive through yeah. and so James dies and then two weeks later he's not there. You know who doesn't notice that? Chris Christie does not yeah. notice that because someone else is handing him his burger and fries. Yeah. Just keeping it real. You know, it, it is amazing to me at this point that not even one of either the politicians or especially one of the media figures has like even just as sort of like uh, like a. Uh, just say, I will volunteer. Yeah, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to prove like how much I actually believe we need to get back to work and I'm going to do X for a week or something. Just anything. Not even one of them. They're, they're so justifiably scared of getting this thing that they won't even do a stunt to pretend to take it seriously at this point. And like Chris Christie's going to, yeah, he's going to be sitting at a ball game. No, he's going to be at home. Tucker Carlson, all of them, they're not advocating for them to go back to normal. They're advocating for everyone else to go back to normal. And again, as you pointed out, when the deaths happen, they're like, imagine you go back to work as a result of the advocacy of these a-holes. You go off, you get sick, you die. They're not going to feel bad. They're not going to notice. And they're going to apologize for those saying they're made up, they're elevated, they're throwing in other stuff like your death will be. Like, it won't matter at all to their narrative. Now, really fast, on Chris Christie, yes, he's saying, wear masks, there should be some social distancing, and I believe that that does, uh, deserves a minimal amount of credit because fewer and fewer of the people saying go back to work are even doing that. 
the op-ed that I wrote that got rejected, uh, where I was calling out how Tucker Carlson is against quarantines now, and Laura Ingram was implying that masks are unscientific. Well, just last night she said there was no scientific basis for social distancing. Not like for lockdowns for months. Keeping distance, she thinks there's no scientific basis. I know the scientific basis. It's distance. Objects have to travel... If they have to travel farther, they're less likely to get to where they're trying to go. That's yeah, the scientific I'll, basis. In, there, in anything that I reject, as far as the theory scientifically, I'm willing to prove. So I'm not a flat earther. And if I'm on a boat that's going towards the end, quote unquote, end of the earth, because it looks like it, I'm willing to do that because I'm pretty sure I'm not going to fall off. I'd like to know if Laura Ingram is willing to go out and start getting everyone's faces, going to these hospitals, since social distancing doesn't matter. It's a myth. Mm -hmm. Go get in someone's face. Yep. Go get in someone's face that you know has the disease or has the virus. Go ahead. Do it. It doesn't matter, right? I'm willing to prove the things that I know <laughs> are real when it comes to something like that. Why aren't you? JR, do you, um, do, when you like sneeze and cough, do you cover? Because that's like, unscientific. Oh, it's unscientific oh, yes. to cover. It, why would you do that? There's no reason to. No, like the point that we're at right now is we are trying to convince people of the germ theory of disease. That germs are how disease spreads. If you don't cover it up, if you get in someone's face and the germ goes from you to them, they'll get the disease. She was disputing so this, that effectively yesterday on her show. This, this is just, so that disputes every kind of, 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 a, of a cold, flu, anything that people catch from each other. It's disputing the validity of all of that. Mm -hmm. She doesn't believe in any of it. Flu doesn't exist. Cold doesn't exist. None of that exists. People don't catch these things. No, it doesn't happen that way. It's just, maybe it's only this. You see the other, other viruses that people catch from each other, that we have vaccines for. No, those, those things are just made up. It's just, I mean, those things are real, but this is the only thing. I don't, no, who they're trying to convince is the people in society that are willing to, to be their lemmings and follow them off a cliff, but except the Ingrams of the world stop at the edge of that cliff while everyone else runs off. Yeah, she you enjoys know, it. yeah. There's no point in social distancing. Like they're literally like there was um did you see the story in Boston? There was one of these anti-lockdown protests and a big crowd was chanting uh that the coronavirus is a hoax. No. Oh. So yeah. when Trump told his audience 2 months ago it was a hoax and then we criticized him for doing that and the right's response was, "Hey, he doesn't mean that the disease is a hoax. He means the coverage is a hoax." Our response was I don't care if that's what he thought. That's not the message he's sending. And his moronic followers are not going to get that. They're going to think the whole thing's a hoax. Two, mo two months later, we still have people, after 70,000 deaths, saying it's a hoax. Apparently, they missed some of the subtext that master communicator yeah. Donald Trump was trying to deliver to them. They know once it's stuck, it's stuck. It's just the way it is. Once they've said it, they, they can go back later, and it doesn't really make that sense. And then reel back and say, oh, yeah, I actually should wear a mask. I actually should do this, uh, a la Vice President Pence. Oh, yeah, I should have worn a mask at the main clinic. Yeah, maybe I should have, but it's too late now. You've already told enough people that don't get by the first step. They're like, oh, yeah, Mike Pence didn't wear a mask. There. It's okay. Oh, yeah, Trump said it's a hoax. I'm never getting off of that. Mm -hmm. They know that there's a certain segment of people that will believe it from now on, and that's what they're counting on. By the way, as far as the Ingrams of the world leaving people off cliffs, you know what? At least I have, I have some respect for the pastors who are like, you know what? God is going to protect us from mm. this. Let's all come to church. You know who's there at least? That pastor there. That, that, that is church. a very good point. They actually believed there. it. At least he's screaming in everyone's face and he's really mm. living up to what he's saying. And then the few yeah. of them have died. At least they did it. Yeah, it was a horrible decision. A lot of them died and probably spread it to the people that they were hypothetically trying to protect. But yeah, they did actually seem to believe it. Um, now, really fast, uh, one thing I want to end on is uh, they're saying we need to go back to work, and many people seem to think that we're just done with this. He said, you know, some people are going to die no matter what. And look, some version of that I don't necessarily d disagree with. People are going to die from this, even if everything I or the experts wanted done was done. I think far less people dying is something worth fighting for. Me and some other people seem to disagree about that. Um but uh, the thing that would really bolster their case, if you are going to use the platform you have where you get the millions of people listen to you every day, if you were to say, we desperately need to go back to work, and then the next 30 minutes was, 
And so here is why Trump, get off your ass and make the tests and send out the swabs and send out the masks and make sure that we're ready to go back to work. But they don't do that. No, they say we need to go back to work. And then here's some quack who says masks don't do anything. Like it would be so easy for Ben Shapiro to be like, I, I care about the economy of America and I want to make sure that we get get off our feet. And that's why we need five million tests being conducted daily. And I don't care if it takes the Defense Production Act. It's going to happen. And I'm going to do coverage until it happens. But that's not what he says. He says, we need to go back to work. Some people are going to die. Ain't me, though. How easy would it be to be consistent? But they don't have to be because their audience doesn't demand it. Let's keep it real, John. John uh, Jake and Anna and a few other people have done plenty of Ben Shapiro uh, impersonations. <laughs> and I secretly think they're all bad at them. I mean, uh-huh. they just talk fast and they don't really say what he would say. They just talk really fast, which is, of course, an, an aspect of it. But that one had the right twinge in the voice. It had the right pacing and the whiny tone, man. Congratulations, you. man. You know, you've got the crown from TYT so far for the best. I, I appreciate that. I think I did make a mistake, though, which is that I made eye contact with the camera, which he very rarely does. But anyway, no, no. Um, I, I think it's the one redeeming quality of Ben Shapiro is that it indicates to me that he has a level of shame, that he knows what he's saying is BS, and he doesn't want to look people in the eye as he says it. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, also, if you do believe that we're just ready to go, Uh, that we're past this thing. You know, I've heard that the curve is flattened. Take a look at this. When you separate out New York and the rest of the United States, average COVID-19 cases are still rising daily. Yes, New York, which has received a very large percentage of all of the national response, which it should, because it was hardest hit. Their numbers are going down. The rest of the country is still going up on average. And God, I hope it goes down. And I will acknowledge it when it does. By the way, yesterday, uh, total deaths in a one-day period... We're down a good bit, which is good news. And we should appreciate good news when it comes. But cases are still rising. And we're what? We're 10 days away from the beginning of Georgia having reopened and Texas having reopened. And so we're going to look. We're going to look nationally. And we're going to look at the states. And maybe this gamble will pay off. But again, it's a gamble where the dice is a working class. Not the people throwing the dice. They're going to be fine. They win either way. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll say it only one more time. I live 10 minutes from the beach. Trust me, I want to be there. And trust yeah. me, the reason I moved to L.A. from uh, the, the tundra, the climate, or whatever it is that was Detroit, Michigan, uh, is partially because of weather and the beach. So I made my whole life decision on where I'm going to be because of something like what I'm not able to do. What is my motivation for sitting in the house again when I don't want to? What's my motivation for, for pushing this hoax of a thing on everyone else? in Kansas. What does that have to do with me? Like, there's no motivation for this. In fact, I should be the one who wants to get out more than anyone else. Yeah. No... Anyways, let's just, just always remember that every time someone tells you you're looking to destroy because you're a part of what they're saying you're trying to destroy. People are struggling to find uh, the right thing to wear as a facial covering when going to the store. Not everyone has access to, um, you know, the right protective masks. People have taken to making their own. Literally anything you can come up with is more appropriate than what I'm about to show you. This is a photo that was taken at a Vons supermarket in Santee, California, near San Diego. Sort of speaks for itself. This individual wearing what looks to be a clan hood while shopping in a Vons in the produce section. Customers were taking photos of him, probably scared that the sort of person that would wear a clan hood in a store is also the sort of person who might pull out a gun and start shooting at any given second. Now, eventually, he was asked to remove it as he was checking out. He'd been asked multiple times already and refused. As he was checking out, he was asked to remove it. He did. He purchased his groceries and left. And obviously the employees at Vons were scared because, again, there's a threat of violence inherent in wearing a clan hood in public. It's one of those instances of trying to get a rise out of people, trying to get attention. You know, it's it's an in-person online troll type of thing. You know, usually you post a picture of this to try and get people to respond with comments and hate towards you. This guy wanted it in person, and his only level of bravery is looking for a potential punch in the back of the head that someone could give him. So he's trying to make a point of, oh, we're going to wear face coverings? I got a face covering for you. This is my speculation about his own motivation behind it. He's bored. He's sitting in the house. Or maybe he's walking on like the other protesters. Who knows? But he's trying to make a point at the same time, trying to get a rise out of people. 
all I hope is that people didn't give him that rise because what we do know about people like this, um, Klansmen never roll around solo. You know why? Because they're cowards. So yeah. when he's rolling around solo, he's actually walking around scared, wishing he had his boys with him because that's his only level of fake confidence he has in himself is having other a-holes like him near him. So uh, this is one of those people that, that I would choose to ignore um, and then just allow life to take care of them because yeah. it always does. You know, I don't – do you know Santee? I actually don't know the Santee area. I know San Diego yeah. area. Um, My, I'm going to – I'm going to guess it's probably a pretty white area. I don't know it's, for sure. It's not It's not the deep populated downtown area of San Diego. Put it that way. Yeah, I just – I wonder if he would have done the same sort of trolling thing in other – you just pick a random area in California. Would he have done that? I doubt it. And how do you have it? What did, you, what did he well, make it? Yeah, that's the thing. It's it's not that's you know what it's weird that you said that because I totally noticed that it was a subconscious thought. I was like, that's not a makeshift hood. It's not like mm-hmm. he grabbed a couple sheets and put it over his head and cut out the eye holes. You know, that has the full like wherever they get it at the you know at the clan uh, 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 you know outlet store where they get all their you know, all huh. their guards. Wherever this is made or created, he looks like he had the official one with the insignia logo on the back saying made yeah. by him. So um, this is official. It's not like he, again. It's not like he threw it on it. So it's probably some level of pre-usage mm-hmm. that he's had before in this. So I mean, he sees the real deal. And um, again, life will take care of him. Yeah, I, just, God, I can't. I can't. I can't imagine. Like I, I, I can't allow people like like that to to permeate my being because okay. I'm too good for it. That, so, I mean, that's my, a my, wise my stance. Being, yeah, my point being, if you're there. And, you know, people that are you know, general racists that are just being racist on their own, I don't feel a need to go up on someone if they're not all up on me. Mm-hmm. So generally life will take care of them because they're yeah. the bottom of the barrel already. And for you to let people get inside of you like that, you're letting them know. Yeah, I will try not to. I will finish by <laughs> saying, not about him, um, I saw, I think it was a comment on a tweet I sent about this. Um, that there is a uh, piece of religious headwear, I believe, used in Spain. Um, I think it's a caparote. I think I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced or how it's spelled. Um, I don't think that's what this is. I'm just going to say that. Both the Senate and the House have been looking to have Dr. Fauci testify uh, before them for different reasons. The House would like to uh, ask a few questions about the White House response to the pandemic. And up until recently, the White House has said he can't testify at the House because he's too busy. This morning, though, Trump revealed the real reason. Why would you let Fauci testify in the House? Because the House is a setup. The House is a bunch of Trump haters. Uh, they put every Trump hater on the committee, the same old stuff. Uh, they frankly want our situation to be unsuccessful, which means death, which means death. And our situation is going to be very successful. And it's just a setup. Uh, but uh, Dr. Fauci will be testifying in front of the Senate, and he looks forward to doing that. So uh, making clear there that... No, it's not that he's too busy. In fact, I'm going to send him to the Senate, which is, of course, conveniently controlled by Republicans. The House? No, I'm not going to. Why? Because they're Trump haters. They don't get to speak to the doctor that is at the heart of the White House response to a pandemic um, that has killed more than 70,000 Americans because they don't like me enough. So their job to do oversight over me, no, they don't get to do that unless they like me. So here's another um... First off, he blew up their whole spot saying, as you mentioned already, he blew up their whole spot saying that this was actually because he's too busy. In reality, it's because you don't want him to talk to anyone. Number one. Um, uh, also, number two, there's an admission that, so if the House hates Trump and then and therefore you don't want them to talk to Fauci, you're undermining Fauci's objectivity, his know-how, his approach to everything like this, which means if they hate Trump, why would that connect to them talking to Fauci and then that being a bad thing? I thought he's just giving us facts. Now you're claiming that Fauci is just your errand boy, that he's saying whatever you want him to. Mm-hmm. Which one is it? Because if they hate him, if they hate Trump, what does that have to do with Fauci? Yeah. So you're saying that Fauci is you. So he's lying every day because he's disagreed with you plenty of times and tried not to make you look as bad as you make yourself look all the time. Yeah. So he, he can't keep his logic straight because he's too wrapped up in this bias and his approach to saying, hey, those guys bad, these guys good. 
they want everyone to die, as you just said in that clip, by not, by not wanting us to be successful. Hey, newsflash, 70,000 people dead. I think we've already got that death thing going under you. Exactly. Yeah. No, like, it would be one thing if, man, you'd really nailed it. And the Democrats who secretly want to destroy the economy, even though we always criticize them as being like way too willing to do the work of economic elites, Wall Street, all that. He, he misses that. He thinks they're against the economy and they want people to die. If you had successfully been protecting people, but buddy, you failed worse than my worst fears, my worst nightmares. You failed more than that. They get to ask questions at that point. When when you have pitched 70,000 Americans as a great success story and like we're ready for our comeback, no, you don't get to say that they just hate you too much. Um, and the thing is, I, I don't include this video. I'm not doing this story because um, I think, uh, you know, if we do it, they'll get to talk to him or whatever. Uh, it's, it's as a warning that um, Trump has, like when we were talking about impeachment and what happens if he survives this, is that he'll be freed up, there'll be no oversight. Uh, I want to continually remind people, um, I'll use some term other than I told you so. Um, I informed you thusly that uh, <laughs> this is what he's going to do. And so uh, every day he gets rid of another inspector general. And now when there's a request to talk to a very reasonable medical professional, he gets to just say publicly, no, they hate me and I don't like haters. And then that's it. He's done. No oversight. So, like, w w why would it be different over the next four years? That, like, if, if we find out about some sort of scandal, which, by the way, we're already far less likely to even find out about it because the inspector generals are gone. They're weeding out leakers every day and all that whistleblowers. Um, he's just going to say, no, I don't need to do what you say. Like, what, what are they going to try to impeach him again? No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> He is going to be able to do anything he wants, and we are unlikely to ever find out what it is that he is doing. That is it's the obvious. situation we're in. Straight up, obviously. Let's, let's, let's cover up anything that they might say that we don't know is happening, because they're a little bit too much on the side of the truth. Yeah. And, and, and there's no covering it up. He doesn't even care to. Why? He doesn't need to. In fact, he, <laughs> like, and his fans don't want him to. His fans like the corruption, and they like him attacking people who point it out. The Lincoln Project is out with our most recent ad, a riff off of a uh, very famous Reagan era ad attacking Donald Trump for his lack of success in addressing coronavirus. There's mourning in America. Today, more than 60,000 Americans have died from a deadly virus Donald Trump ignored. With the economy in shambles, more than 26 million Americans are out of work. The worst economy in decades. Trump bailed out Wall Street, but not Main Street. This afternoon, millions of Americans will apply for unemployment. And with their savings run out, many are giving up hope. Millions worry that a loved one won't survive COVID-19. There's mourning in America. And under the leadership of Donald Trump, our country is weaker and sicker and poorer. And now, Americans are asking, if we have another four years like this, will there even be an America? Paid for by the Lincoln Project, which is responsible. Okay, so uh, that ad obviously very critical of Donald Trump. And um, the salt in the wound is that they are called the Lincoln Project. And we know Donald Trump respects Abraham Lincoln so much, JR. Uh, <laughs> was it an effective ad? What do you, what do you think? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very Republican as well. So... I mean, at least when you have anti-Trump Republicans, you still see the Republicanism in this ad. So, you know, the, like, that last line is the most Republican thing to say. Will there even be America? Like, it's a, such a general statement that anyone who is in agreement for the point can say, yeah, I put a picture in my head of what it looks like for it not to be an America anymore. Because they've used that line to say that about immigration. They've used that line to say that about any other minorities. Um, will there be another America if they keep doing this to us? So that line speaks, and it's going to be powerful to the to audience because the audience usually laps that up. But now they're seeing it as a target, as Donald Trump, with these images of people in poverty, sick, dying, weak, all these things that he was touting. Man, it is it is down the line, checks off everything he cares about, and makes him the bad guy. Yeah. They know how to do this stuff, man, and they know what gets to him. Yeah, they do. I. 
I don't think it's quite as effective as some that I've seen. I had Jordan Yule on. He he showed one of the move on ads re- recently was put out was very good. But if you're going to use the style that we know appeals to Republicans, which is that morning in America Reagan ad style, um, I think it's pretty effective. And look, I think the overall message needs to be and it's not going to get through to the Trump cultists, but perhaps to some people that are like sort of they switch back and forth, maybe um, is he said he would make us great again. And things are obviously, objectively, visibly worse in every way. You can't (laughs) argue against that. He's not running on CAG anymore. He's back to running on MAGA because he has to, because even he acknowledges that he ruined this thing. And that is the message people need. Yeah, and it has to be someone else's blame. You know the push has become now. China, China, China. Make sure you point out it's them, it's them, it's them, it's them, it's them. It has nothing to do with us. Look what they did to us. Because, you know, we're the most powerful nation in the world and we couldn't have done anything about this, yeah. even though it originated somewhere else. So we see the shift here because he can't push with the normal thing. So this ad, I think, undercuts that shift mm-hmm. a bit. Like it keeps pointing out, Americans have to be reminded of the obvious things about our history, even recent history as of last year. Our most recent history about things that people do. They're like, hey, you know what he did, right? Remember what he did, right? We have to say it a million times because, you know, we're going to hear an opposite side. You know what he didn't do, right? They're going to recreate this history. They're going to say yeah. he was the savior. Trust me, he's going to walk out with a cloak on and then open up his arms like he opened up the the, the sea and parted it and <laughs> everyone walked through behind him. He's yeah. going to act like he's the man. So the reminders have to be put in place. That's why it angers him so much because it goes against his plans. Yeah. Uh, now let's turn to Trump's response because you never know for sure. Is he going to see these attack ads? He saw this one. It's pretty clear because take a look at what he tweeted. In the middle of the night, the president of the United States tweeted, a group of rhino Republicans, and by the way, we're going to cut in and out because there's a lot here. A group of rhino Republicans who failed badly 12 years ago, then again eight years ago, and then got badly beaten by me. A political first timer. He ran for president multiple times. He's not a first timer. Four years ago, I've copied, no imagination, the concept of an ad from Ronald Reagan, morning in America, really fast. No imagination. The whole point you idiot, is that they're mimicking the style. They know <laughs> that people are going to know where they got that from. No much, no much they, they titled it to be the same and sound on purpose. Well, no, I'm sorry. So, John, so I just want everyone to continue. Uh, to, as you continue to think about specifically what you're going to say he's saying. And this comes <laughs> after he said they had no imagination. Now think about the names he calls everyone. <laughs> yes. Because he has imagination. On, keep your keep your mind on the no imagination. One. Yes. Okay. So let's demonstrate some imagination. So uh, we're we're skipping one. If you want the full collected works, it's available on Twitter. I'd die. <laughs> so we're skipping. We got two more because they don't know how to win, and their so-called Lincoln Project is a disgrace to honest Abe. <laughs> I don't know what Kellyanne did to her deranged loser of a husband, Moonface, but it must have been really bad. Okay, let's stop there. Okay, so he's called, the President of the United States is calling some guy that I wish we didn't need to know who it was. Um, It's George Conway, right? Moon, moon Moonface. He's attacking the look of his face. Glass faces, buddy. <laughs> Glass faces. <laughs> number one. And number two, remember earlier we talked about Don Lemon uh, calling mm-hmm. out uh, Trump and saying, what's the problem? Why do you hate, why do you hate Obama so much when he brought up his, uh, Trump's wife? This is why I'm okay with him bringing up Trump's wife. Because why should gloves come off for, for this guy but not for anyone else? That's all I'm saying. The, the whole bringing up wives, no, this isn't a Don Lemon joint. This is something that Trump has been doing for a long time. Ask Ted Cruz, bro. Yeah, I know, I know. I want to be better. Not that much better, but better. Um, but anyway, look, he called Moonface. We have a photo of Moonface. Oh, wait, no, that's a different one. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, okay, so he calls him Moonface because he made a, a political ad or whatever. And so then, uh, it looks like we don't have this graphic, but he goes on to say, Lost for Evan McMuffin McMullen to me. He, so Evan McMullen, if you if you don't remember everybody, he was a third party candidate that did quite well. I believe it was in Utah. I'm not sure. He just referred to this individual as McMuffin, like like the sandwich. Like he's Homer Simpson, and he, he, he the only thing he didn't type was the. Mm. I don't know <laughs> exactly. I don't. What is that a joke about? 
Is it just that his name is McMullen and McMuffin yes. is similar? Yes. Does he look like a sandwich? Is he eggy? That's all, that's all it is, John. It's, it's just, just his that his... Yep. Yep. They, if, if he had a, if he had a problem with Miss McConnell, he'd call him Mick Con Artist or something. <laughs> I don't know. That's not bad. Um, be- no, but but that's not that's not the same thing because that's implying he's a con artist. It's not just changing a letter; that's true. it's changing a letter to mean something. That's just true. call him McRubbin. <laughs> I don't know why. McTuffin, <laughs> McSluff stuff. I don't know. They think that he's a clever troll. Oh. I don't get it. It's not the only McMuffin I want to hear is that great line from Superbad. That's it. <laughs> They're all losers, but Abe Lincoln, Republican, is all smiles. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. I don't know what anything means anymore. But anyway, clearly, bad ass got under his skin. He's a great, he's a great counterpuncher, is what it, I keep hearing. Yeah, if by counterpuncher you mean that he blindfolds himself and then just starts spinning. And, <laughs> and then falls over and throws up on himself. That's his counterpunching. <laughs> It anyway. is, and people love it because it's it, it's all about supporting him no matter what. It's what That's his true. life has always been. Failure at every point, but somehow people are saying, no, 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 you're great. No, that was, that was awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you called him McMuffin. That was great. Okay. I remember people celebrated some of his lines, and I said, wait, wait, is this is a joke. Are you guys, like, you know, when people sarcastically laugh with you, yeah. that's what I thought was happening. I was like. You're making fun of him, right? Because that was whack. You don't have to be clever. You just have to be cleverer than the least clever people in the country. Um, Someone in the comments, Serena Rada says, my six-year-old son calls him Donald Dump. So here's the thing. That is a more clever insult because it's not just changing the letters. It's implying that he's poop. There's a meaning there. It's juvenile, but in the kid's defense, it's kid. McMuffin, there's no meaning and honestly, like, keep McMuffin out of your mouth, because that's a good sandwich. That's an American <laughs> classic. <laughs> also, keep it out of your mouth. Um, but anyway, uh, JR, uh, I was glad that we were able to end with a little bit of fun. And thank uh, you so much for joining me. Always fun to have you on the show. It's uh, it's always fun. Um, what's happening tomorrow? Am I back tomorrow? What's going on? Uh, on? I think Emma is going to be joining us tomorrow, but I will text you at 11 p.m. to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Time to renegotiate my Wednesday contract. Maybe, exactly. Because marketing Wednesdays and we're pushing Tuesdays, this yes. is going to be a problem. Exactly. Oh, and by the way, we're going to be doing an internal TDR meeting later this week. And one of the things we want to talk about, we're trying to like rethink things and everything. One thing we're thinking is we want to do some brainstorming for like Brett gets to do garbage people each Friday. I want you to have a recurring segment. And so if oh, you right. if you want to contribute, let us know some ideas. Otherwise, we might just come up with something. Yeah, I might come up with something that's a little bit too raw and explicit. But that's we'll okay. I, I don't mind. It could be a JR rated segment. <laughs> Maybe it's like it's like a thought from JR that he's not sure he should actually express once a week. <laughs> Bro, you don't want to do it. I got in trouble with the Kit Kats already. <laughs> I don't remember the Kit Kats, but the I Kit say Kats we try. Three Musketeers was Halloween. Oh, I threw yes. them out. <laughs> okay, well. Um, okay, okay, yeah. I, no, I, I, if it's something we'll like talk. that, I, I got you. Okay, okay, we'll talk. Uh, but right. anyway, thank you for joining us. Uh, have a good one. Guys, good to see you guys. See you. Thank you. Uh, and everybody at home, let's see what's been going on with the old Super Chat. Uh, I go into my document. So I have this document where um, uh, Bart and Craig put in tweets and super chats and comments and stuff like that. The first thing I see is, uh, hey, it's you, McMuffin, <laughs> which is one of my favorite lines from that movie. Um, okay, so uh, it also says don't promote gun violence. And the reason is I wanted to mention one thing. I, f- I want to give credit to the individual, but I can't remember who it was that said the sort of sinking feeling that they feel when they hear people talking about, hey, there are going to be deaths. We just have to go back to work and accept it is... It might have been a reference to Dave Rubin or whatever. It's this feels like the gun violence thing where we have a shocking level of deaths that we have just accepted are going to happen. Um, Not because we can't do anything about it. Like with gun violence, we know what we need to do to stop it and we can stop it, but we choose not to because of something, something freedom. We have this sick, toxic idea of what freedom is that has been weaponized by the elites to get us killed for their economic benefit. And because of that, 
we just won't do anything to stop the deaths. And, uh, you know, if that means that we accept a couple of dozen people getting shot up at a school every two weeks or every three weeks, um, it seems like it'd be a big jump to accepting 3,000 deaths every day, but I guess that's the direction we're going in. I've expanded a bit on the tweet, but that's, that's sort of how I feel too. We've just accepted it's terrible, it's a tragedy, but it's not a tragedy that we're going to do anything about. And that doesn't feel great. With that, let's jump back in. Sonia uh, Otwell says, John, you always look, no matter how serious a subject, like you're about to crack a smile, perhaps at the utter absurdity of reality right now. That is nearly my permanent feeling. As always, love the show. You keep me saying thank you, Sonia. And as I've said before, um, it's not a thing that I can control. I'm almost doing it right now. Uh, it's like a defense mechanism. Like, because things are so fundamentally irrational, and because all of the incentives are so effed up, I kind of have to smile to not just, again, what I want to do, I expressed this on the show like a week ago, is scream so loud that the universe ends, but I can't do that, so I smile. Uh, Benjamin Matthews says, I almost hit unlike when I heard Shapiro thinking I was watching the wrong show. Then I realized it was just John doing an impersonation. Funny stuff. Thank you. Hopefully it'll never happen again. Uh, Jay Padden, thank you for your super chat. Bernice Pander says, John, I uh, didn't mean you check him out just for anyone, lol. Hey, I'm anyone. I can check him out, too. And Rob Shively says, a guy flashed me with his swastika tattoo that covers half his chest at Target in Sacramento. These people are everywhere. Whew. Um, and I would imagine that, like in this situation, the immediate thought is, is this person armed? Are they going to do something insane? Bridesbart says, JR, I feel bad, but I laughed at Clan Outlet Store. Thank you. I'm sure you'd appreciate that. Christopher says, hey, John, I'm not sure if you know about Richard Branson's attempt to get multiple governments to pay him money despite not closing any businesses, but could you check it out for me? I trust TIT to get it right. Thank you. I had not heard about that, actually, but I will. Another. Thank you. Amanda says, I was literally stabbed in the back by a Klansman I was throwing out of a building I was security at. So scary. Stab a little girl from behind. Wow. I am sorry to hear that, Amanda. Osborne says, I informed you thusly. Nice Sheldon Cooper reference, you nerd. I saw a lot of people saying that. I did not consciously make a reference to Big Bang Theory. Um, and the thing on the left says, John, no story on Justice Dem potential super PAC. Um, no, I, I just saw something about it. I need to do a little bit more research to understand exactly what that means and what the implications of it is. But but thank you for raising that as a concern. Uh, Gabby on the Twitter said, don't worry, John. We just have to wait a few decades until 2063 when the Vulcans arrive. Then we'll all be well. That's true, but I'm sure you are well aware of what happened in the decades leading up to the Vulcans arising, or arriving, and I don't want to experience that. Let's see. Thank you for the Ben Shapiro. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. And Liberal Snowflake feels JR's anger. At least ignorance isn't contagious, just the virus. And Kira says, uh, hashtag TDR Live, it sure is difficult to stay six feet away from people when the grocery store is packed full. Thanks, Georgia. Yeah, 100%. They, they will occasionally throw up, some of them will throw up a, hey, we're going to still social distance. Some people, like Laura Ingram, are done with that, too. Um, but they don't actually care about that. They just want to get things going. Because they are accurately reading that even though the vast majority of Americans don't want things to go back to normal, more and more people every day are becoming desensitized to the amount of death. Like, they're, they're predicting a 9-11 every day by June, and then continuing on for some time. And they think that it's okay. Anyway, so unfortunately, we didn't end on the fun part. It got a little bit dark after that, but thank you to everyone uh, who tuned in. Hope you had fun with JR and myself, maybe learned uh, a little something as well. Uh, tomorrow, we've got Emma Vigland. You know that's going to be awesome. Also, later on today, after the main show, after the Young Turks, uh, I'm going to be joining Anna. We're going to be doing a three hour uh, Giving Tuesday special, which should be a lot of fun. We got some games planned. There's some secrets that haven't been revealed even to the other people on the panel yet. So it should be a lot of fun. Hopefully, I'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad free, access members only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co/tyt. I'm your host, John Darola. I'll see you soon.